Hello, fellow risk takers, and welcome to my worst investment ever. Stories of loss to keep you winning. In our community, we know that to win in investing, you must take risk, but to win big, you've got to reduce it. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm on a mission to help 1 million people reduce risk in their lives. To reduce risk in your life, go to myworstinvestmentever.com today and take the risk reduction assessment I created from the lessons I've learned from more than 500 guests. Fellow risk takers, this is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stotts from A. Stotts Academy, and I'm here with featured guest, Mark McNally. Mark, are you ready to join our mission? I am. Let's do it, Andrew. All right. Well, let me introduce you to the audience, and I think you've got some good lessons for our mission. Mark McNally is a serial entrepreneur with broad experience scaling companies from startup to multinational establishments. A passionate product and marketing strategist, Mark is one of the original innovators in the e-commerce space, rapidly expanding online buying internationally since the 90s. Mark's journey has crossed 14 startups that have raised over 300 million US dollars and have seen over $5 billion in exits. These startups pioneered their days from machine learning and e-commerce to healthcare and consumer products. He continues in that spirit as the founder and chief nobody at Nobody Studios, founded in 2020. Mark, take a minute and tell us about the value you bring to the world. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Um, look, I think uh, most of my colleagues and the folks I get the pleasure to work with will, will say that my value is my ability to, to think bigger than the average person, to, to be comfortable swinging bigger than most folks um, and actually believe that by swinging bigger, you actually improve your odds of success. Um, and yeah, common, commonly told by people who join our journey that um, the idea that they're being a part of something bigger than they're even capable of imagining is what gets them out of bed. And so I always try to make sure I'm playing that role every day. Exciting. Um, and when we talked before, you know, I can see that, you know, you like to join the dots and all that. Maybe just um, give, a, give a little uh, intro about no, what you're doing at Nobody Studios, just so <sighs> the audience can understand. Yeah, look, uh, uh, inspired and informed by a you know, 14 startup career of all ventures founded and funded and um, a lot of things we got right there. So I enjoyed an IPO along the way, multiple exits, my handful of uh, bankruptcies. Um, one of the things I started to see the last three or four or five years in venture capital is we just, I think the entire industry is getting it wrong. And I think that we're, we're heading to a massive kind of uh, recalibration. Um, I feel bad for the current generation of entrepreneurs because one of the things that inspired me is I was always doing mentorship or angel investing and, you know, or, or some kind of consulting along the way. And I just kept hearing again and again and again from founders all that mattered to them was valuations and they'd drop terms like unicorn and decacorn like it was just you know peanuts on a table you know and i'm just like these guys don't know what it means to build real businesses and they don't even understand the economics that they've lost control of their companies and they don't understand the economics that they now have to sell their companies for billions of dollars to have an exit um and i know that when the money when the music stops and valuations come back down to some kind of reality and those companies aren't going to be able to get funding and that every investor is going to be wiped out in down rounds and that a lot of the employees that worked really hard for years are going to be cut. And I've just been through it so many times and mm -hmm. I'm just wondering to myself, why are we getting this wrong after so many lessons? And um, so Nobody Studios is a venture studio. We create our own companies. Um, we do it often. We do it aggressive. We have a goal to do 100 companies in five years. We are myopically focused on the very earliest stages of company creation, so zero to 18 months from taking a concept from a whiteboard into in the market with customers. Yep. Um, then we bolt it on to other investors so the company can leave its nest and, and stand on its own two feet. Um, and then we're, we're focused on making, keeping the cap tables lean enough that we can be optimized for earlier and mid-stage exits, which is where we would think the real gap is in the market. Got it. Yeah, I'm reminded of episode 235 when I interviewed Rand Fishkin, and he talked about don't be afraid to stand up against the growth at all cost venture capital model. And I think, yep. you know, when I hear what you're saying, it somewhat resonates with some, some of the stuff that he shared. And I think it's, uh, it's valuable because uh, most of the guys in your space is just 
growth and valuation, and they don't care about a business. So I think that's mm -hmm. a particular value that you bring. So fantastic. Well, now it's time to share your worst investment ever, and since no one goes into their worst investment thinking it will be, tell us a bit about the circumstances leading up to it, and then tell us your story. Well, uh, yeah, I get to go uh, way back. My my very first startup that I got involved in when I came out of the military was uh, just a startup rocket ship dream. You know, a couple of guys had this idea they could connect buyers and suppliers on this new thing called the internet. And that was back in 96. I joined as employee eight. We grew it to 800 employees. I was in the upper five of executives at that company when we went public on the NASDAQ in 99. So on one hand, it was just wild. You know, we got to almost a $5 billion market cap and everything that, you know, Mark, 25 year old Mark McNally ever dreamt of being available to him was. Um, but I learned a really important lesson. Um, but basically, a, a upside return is only realized investment if you take money off the table. And, uh, you know, a couple of years later, the market corrected itself and we were in really good company with companies like Worldcom, Worldcom going bankrupt and Amazon was at $1.27 a share. Um, and a lot of companies went down when the market corrected itself. And, you know, so for me, that was the worst because I saw 25 year old Mark lose eight figures of net worth really, really quickly um, and had to, had to live with those, those lessons for a while. And I'm curious, like, is there a day or a moment in your life at that time where you kind of felt like, holy crap, I just, you know, it all kind of fell in for me. Uh, I was riding so high. Was there any particular time or day that you really can remember, like, it all kind of hit you? Um, well, yeah, my, my birthday is April 18th, and uh, April 18th, 2000, I got uh, my margin call from, from a well-known investment bank. Um, and, and I was really conservative when I took margin. I remember still talking to my stock broker. I'm like, look, I'm only going to take six or 7% coverage on my stock. And that was enough for me to start playing around with, but no one could have fathomed that stock would drop 94%, you know? And, and so, yeah, getting that margin call was a really interesting lesson for, for a 25 year old. And I'll never forget that day. Yeah. And I'm curious, like, um, how did that affect your confidence? So a lot of times when we get hit like that, it sets us back, you know, emotionally, or were you able to immediately bounce back and it didn't bother you? Oh gosh, you know, I, I'll give a lot of respect to my my colleagues and mentors at the time who were, you know, my age now, you know, I was, I was really, you know, quite young for the executive team. And, you know, I remember the look on their face looked very different than mine because they did feel like, oh man, that might've been my last good shot, <laughs> you know, of my career. And I was lucky enough to look at it and say, hey, I'm still young and I've got all these lessons and I figured out how to do that once and I can do it easier and faster again. And mm -hmm. I've been on that quest since. Um, when you're part of something like that, you know, it kind of gets you hooked. Yep. At least it demystifies what it looks like to go big. So yep. and I think that was always a, a gift for me. But, you know, one of the lessons for me also is just when you're part of a wealth creation event like that and then a, a wealth decreation event like that, you learn a lot about people mm. and things I never expected to understand about people's dynamics and how they play a role. In. I mean, multiple times I could have sold chunks of stock. The pressure was immense not to and how you let someone else imposed their will upon you with those kinds of pressures and yet mm. it could have changed the financial future of you know me and my family it's just, it was an interesting lesson and one that i'll never forget so how would you summarize if you were to kind of say you know one two three these are the things i learned from that experience well one i learned um first and foremost that um you can't get too enamored with people's cvs and you got to look past and who they really are how they're going to deal with adversity uh, i've came to be very sensitive to any kind of manipulative type personalities because I didn't mm -hmm. want to have that in my life. Um, and also how people are going to mistake, you know, the scorecard, the financial scorecard for who they are as a human being. You know, I really saw people that if the stock was good one day or one week or one month, they just thought they were a better person. And watching that in real time was a real shock to me. Mm -hmm. um, but one that I promised would not be me moving forward. Um, you know, like I said, I think the other big lesson I repeat is, you know, having to be de demystify what it looks like going big for me was a gift because everything I'm a part of now, I feel like, you know, sky's the limit if you get the, the why right and the execution right. And I meet brilliant people every day who just don't believe going big is something that they do. It's something that Elon Musk does or Steve Jobs. It's like a different person. Um, so that was a, a gift for me. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah. And uh, maybe I'll summarize a few things I'd take away. I mean, the first thing that I would say is that trust only happens over time. 
there is no hack or shortcut for building trust. Unlike other things where you could say, okay, for fitness, maybe you got a hack. You could go, you know, to a, you know, a fitness uh, resort for two weeks and you could do amazing things, you know. Uh, yeah. Of course, it's not going to necessarily last forever. But the point is, is that with trust, even if you went and you did something together with someone, it, it builds a bit. But that only happens by, trust only happens by seeing people's reactions in seriously adverse events. And I think about my best friend, Dale, when we started a coffee factory here in Thailand many years ago, we faced some pretty extreme events. And to watch his behavior through the whole thing, to never, ever take for himself and always be thinking about, okay, how do I make sure I protect the whole business, the employees, the shareholders, yeah. and all that, made me think, I'll put whatever I have behind him. And he's lived up to that for decades. So trust yeah. is the first thing you may, made me think about. Um, the other thing I thought about, you know, about this concept of being connected to the market, you know, and how um, when I started as a stockbroker in Thailand, I, I was in the research and we had sales and we had sales trading and all that buzz is happening. And, you know, I just was never that interested in like watching the market. I was much more interested as an analyst to dig deep into something. So mm -hmm. I just really wasn't drawn into that. And then to watch the financial people eat behind the scenes, here we are at a broker and we're servicing yeah. the biggest clients in the world. And I just think that these guys are just all riding a roller coaster. And, you know, I, I swear, I've never done, been able to do it. And I'm, maybe there's research out there. But if we were to do research on the performance of investment professionals with their own money, I suspect it's terrible. And it's terrible because they are just totally affected by the movements of the market. And so I think you just remind me that, you know, don't think that the people behind the scenes are some wise guys that are really thinking this thing through. They're just going on a roller coaster ride, and oftentimes they think that they're doing the right thing by bringing you along. <laughs> yeah, no, I remember we were getting ready for our secondary offering in Wall Street and one of the largest banks, investment banks in the world, and the managing director was sitting there looking at our model, and we were so proud that we were gonna be profitable in about two years. Um, and he ripped into us for not being aggressive enough. And he said, I don't want to see profits for 10 years. You're not growing fast enough. And, you know, in the dot-com bubble blew up, it was that same guy as being quoted by the Wall Street Journal saying, yeah, across the board, we, we bet on the wrong young guys. And these guys didn't have experience. It's like, you know, what really goes on in the boardrooms and the direction they give you, you know, for me, it really, you know, taught me to develop my gut and my instincts mm -hmm. and, and fight fight tooth and nail for the right businesses. So, um, and the other thing just was just taking money off the table. You know, I think I've learned that one universal investment advice, right? Is it doesn't matter what it says in the portfolio. doesn't matter how great Bitcoin is today. It'll go down, it'll go up. It's, you know, it's, it's investment returns are when you take money off the table. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think sometimes when you're young in your career, especially if something is going really well, it can be really hard to think of getting off the train if you're afraid it's going to keep going up. Yep. Um, and I had some really interesting lessons in that first journey too. There's a, a an old, you know, older school executive that, you know, he was selling stock often and, and weekly and the rest of us were holding on. And, you know, I remember having a conversation with him and thinking, man, you sold that stock last week and it went up X, Y, and Z what this, this week. <laughs> what a fool. And he's like, and I'll sell it again next week, you know? And when the market crashed, he was the one that everybody was going to asking to invest in their new companies, you know? Um, and another one, we're trying to do an acquisition, actually two acquisitions, exact same kind of story, where we were offering a load of stock, and both of the executives of these two companies said, um, you need to offer me your maximum cash offer, because I'm walking out of here with cash in a suitcase. Mm. And that was like literally the same words for both of them, and both of them are doing really, really well right now. Um, and so, yeah, that, that taught me some lessons to get comfortable with that. And with, with nobody, we'll be building lots of companies you know, 10 to 15 a year is going to be our pace. And so you also realize not to fall in love with any one deal. As long as we can keep yeah. building good companies and exiting them, that's a good business. And some will be bigger than others, but you can't fall in love with the upside. You know, I was in a deal where I helped a, a group uh, to sell their business. And uh, we all, they all use the same investment banker, you know, who was on the deal, who set up the, the bank accounts and everything. So then all of these guys had, you know, a lot of money in the bank. And all of a sudden, they were getting calls from their investment banker and from their private banker and all that. And, uh, and I talked to that private banker, and I just said, look, here's the deal. Never, ever call me. If I have anything that I need from you, I'll call you. So he never called me. And for the other guys, they listened to all the stuff that he said. And I swear, mm. 
all of them probably lost 50% of the money that they made through their deal after we're talking about 15 to 18 years of hard work to build up that money. Yeah. And then they just yeah. listened to people and then, you know, next thing you know, yeah. boom. So based upon what you learned from this story and what you continue to learn, what one action would you recommend <clears throat> our listeners take to avoid suffering the same fate? Um, yeah, I'll just double down on that last point. Um, set your goals, get a little, try to be a little mo- unemotional about it. You know, the whole idea of uh, having set prices that you know you want to sell a certain portion at and get comfortable with that early on before you're emotional, I think is a way to do it. And, you know, if you talk to a professional gambler, they'll say the best time you can be gambling is when you're playing with the house's money. So take your principal off the table, off the table take some return, and then play on the house's money. And so for me, that's certainly the way I've come to. And I can be as instinctual as anybody, but I've just come to try to put some things in, and rules in place to take the emotions out of it as much as possible. Great advice. In fact, we use kind of the opposite in the stop loss where we say, okay, if this mm-hmm. falls from 100 to 80, I'm going to sell you know, 50% yep. of it. And here you're saying, look, if I put in 10 and that goes up to 100, I'm selling 10% of it. That's it. Mm-hmm. That's my goal. That's my... And then when it goes to 200, I'm selling, you know, yep. and so predetermined future action. All right. What is a resource that you'd recommend for our listeners? Uh, I have to bet on myself on that one. Um, so you know, I was on a podcast not too long ago and, and the last question he was asked was, um, how are you going to know when you succeed, Mark? Mm-hmm. And I say, well, um, there'll be a day in the future where an uh, entrepreneur I've not met in person in a country that I've not been to physically is going to identify a problem that I don't necessarily resonate with and proposes a solution in a business that I might even be dubious about and goes and creates it and solves a problem in a viable business using nobody studios. Mm. That'll be the day we arrived. Um, yeah. And it's, it's sooner, sooner than I even hoped when I started this. So mm. um, that, that'll be the resource I can offer other entrepreneurs worldwide. So people should go to uh, tell us about the website and all that. So that anybody listening that thinks I got that great idea, I got that great potential. Yeah. Nobody, st- nobody studios.com. And I'm pretty open book. So Mark at, you know, M-A-R-K at nobodystudios.com and um, we'll be the first venture studio that'll be crowdfunded. We're launching SEC registered crowdfunding at the end of this quarter. Um, so we'll actually have thousands of investors worldwide with their their passions, their ideas, their network brought to bear. And that's actually part of our rocket fuel is to, to, to be the first global venture studio. So we're pretty fired up. Fantastic. Well, we'll have all the links for that in the show notes. So check it out. And hopefully some of the listeners out there will be that person with that great idea that you're even dubious about, but man, they make exactly. it work. They exactly. They make it work. All right, last question. What's your number one goal for the next 12 months? Oh, gosh. Uh, a lot of really amazing people have uh, trusted, put a lot of trust in me to pull this off this year. And this is going to be a big year for us. We're going to be building out our core team, getting the funding behind us, launching 15 companies. And I try to remind myself every single day that I'm a steward of that trust. And, and that's my number one goal is to end this year, look at myself in the, in the mirror, straight in my eyes and feeling proud of what I did with that trust. Mm, beautiful. Well, listeners, there you have it. Another story of loss to keep you winning. If you haven't yet taken the risk reduction assessment, I challenge you to go to myworstinvestmentever.com right now and start building wealth the easy way by reducing risk. As we conclude, Mark, I want to thank you again for joining our mission. And on behalf of A. Stotts Academy, I hereby award you alumni status for turning your worst investment ever into your best teaching moment. Do you have any parting words for the audience? Just love your format. And uh, as you can see from the way we talk about our own studio, we're contrarian in nature. and, And I love that about you. So keep up the good work. Awesome. Well, that's a wrap on another great story to help us create, grow, and protect our wealth. Fellow risk takers, this is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stotts, thanking you for joining our mission. And I'll see you on The Upside.